So, first things first. I need to dress this random pile of 20 year old wood to make it into something a little bit more usable for my needs. These random pieces of wood were originally made as prefabricated pieces of chairs and other furniture. About 20 years ago, my father picked this wood up from the St. Anthony Flea Market here in New Brunswick, Canada, as surplus from the local furniture manufacturer. Fast forward to the present day, and these poor lonely pieces of wood are finally going to be used for something more than collecting dust in the basement. Now, before we proceed, let's grab some tools first. I'll be completely honest with you guys. I kind of have a plan, but I also don't know what I'm going to do yet. So I need to refine these pieces of wood and cut them up into smaller pieces to really get a good idea of how I will proceed with building this PC case. What you see me doing here is checking for the flatness and the straightness on the surfaces that don't have any curvy design features. That way, I know I don't have to plane off any extra wood to give me a true surface to work with. The goal here is to remove those curvy bits to leave me with square lumber to run through the surface planer. So my plan was to whip out the table saw and use that to accomplish this job. Due to very dull blades in combination with fairly thick pieces of wood and the fact that this is only a 110 volt table saw, this plan very quickly eroded, forcing me to switch to the trusty bandsaw for resawing this lumber. So this whole process worked, but it took a very long time, so the fittage is sped up quite substantially. And for any professionals watching, you might be wondering why I kept the guide post up so high when it probably would have cut better if it was locked in at a lower position. And to that, I would say, I have a lot of experience with a bigger bandsaw mill because we mill a lot of our own lumber, but the components are slightly different on one of these smaller vertical shop bandsaws. So needless to say, I'm still getting used to how they work and the best way to use them. Now that we have them all roughly squared up, it's time to bring out the surface planer and more accurately refine these pieces of wood down to something usable. Planing rough lumber has to be one of my all-time favorite woodworking tasks. For me, it's such an amazing experience to see something old, weathered, and discolored come instantly back to life, almost in the blink of an eye. I don't know what it is, and how the experience is not dulled yet for me. There's just something special about it. It's probably how it makes one of the biggest and quickest visual differences, while simultaneously bringing the wood to the right dimension. Just, just wow. I must now take all the remaining smaller pieces of wood and do a similar process, except this time in reverse. This time using the planer to bring the thickness down and make all the pieces thin enough to rip on the table saw without bogging the motor down. Man oh man would it sure be nice for some new fresh sharp blades right about now. On a little side note, for those of you who keep chickens around, the shavings made from planers provide excellent nest for bedding for the lay boxes. You can use the shavings for the house bedding, among other things, but peat moss bedding is far superior in a chicken house and tends to keep the ammonia down much longer. Wood shavings just don't last as long, but for laying boxes, it's perfect. Just a little nice way to use byproducts from woodworking. Just make sure the wood doesn't have any toxic finish on it because chickens can and will eat a lot of it. Time for some more ripping. Oh, and also, some more ripping. <laughs> and last but not least, to finish it off, more ripping. You get the point. And no, that was not a pun because my blades are dull. But not for long. Fast forward to the next morning, an Amazon package has arrived. A much needed package. 
the new blades are in and I no longer have to worry about excessive burn marks or strain on the motor. With a quick blade change and the appropriate blade, we are back in business. This should have been done a long time ago, but hey, it is what it is. The new blades worked exactly as expected and now I can complete this project in style. I have a lot of cross cutting to do, so that new 80 tooth blade is going to make a big difference. Now that I have all the wood broken down into smaller pieces, I can now bring out the motherboard to grab some dimensions from. I'll start by identifying where the anchor points are on the motherboard, and also the overall footprint of the motherboard. I think it was 9 inches and 9 sixteenths by the exact same, so a perfect square. With that information, I can now start making cuts for the motherboard tray. This is where I'll swap out the combo blade, a 40 tooth blade I have on it currently, for an 80 tooth fine cross cutting blade, and whip out the old miter gauge as well. I will be fastening the motherboard tray together using a combination of dado joints, rabbit joints, and wood glue. Once all the grooves are cut, I'll come in and clean it up with a chisel, being careful to only take out as much as I need to so the joints fit relatively tight. Ah uh, yes, that is perfect. Everything seems to be fitting together very nicely. It's time to glue it up and clamp it down. Roughly 24 hours after the glue is cured, I'll come in with the orbital sander and some 150 grit sandpaper and give it a good once over, and then finish with some 220 sandpaper and lightly hand sand it. That's looking pretty good. It's time to drop the motherboard down, trace the holes, and drill for the thread tapper. Before I proceed to drill and tap, I'll first use a pointy tipped nail punch to ensure my drill goes in at just the right spot and doesn't slip away on me. These holes need to be pretty accurate. I actually did a test hole and threaded it out so I could see if I got the right thread tap and that it would indeed be plenty strong enough. Spoiler, it was more than strong enough. And when I was finished drilling and tapping, I'll take it one step further and put a drop of super glue in each hole to strengthen the threads even more. I couldn't believe how well it worked. It's time to build the frame. I'll grab a tool that hasn't been used in a long time, as you can see by the dust that has accumulated on it. Also, let me apologize for the messy nature of the drawers. The shop is currently undergoing major renovations, and I'm kind of in between the renovations at the moment, so everything is just temporarily stuffed away in the drawers. I chose to start with the top and the bottom, carefully picking out pieces that would match for the top because I intend that to be one of the standout features of this case. This whole build actually takes inspiration from a table, and not just any table. One of the most beautiful and elegant tables you'll ever bear witness to, with the finest joinery and craftsmanship that I think I've ever seen. I'd like to give a huge shout out to Nicholas Kramer from Big Tooth Co. for giving me permission to show some of his work on my channel. This table was a huge inspiration for the design of this PC case. He does absolutely beautiful and phenomenal woodworking, like next level handcraft joinery. I highly recommend you go check out his work at his website. Link will be down in the description below accompanied by another link directly to the table displayed in this video. So I'm trimming the top and bottom to size, and off camera I surface planed the biscuit joint at top and bottom of the PC case. My apologies, it's a lot of work recording and trying to get a job done at the same time, and I'm still honing my skills as a YouTuber. Sometimes I forget a thing or two, so please bear with me through the process. After trimming the top and the bottom, I will now proceed to rip some of those small pieces of wood on the table saw at a 45 degree angle. I noticed that the corner pieces I was currently making would make a nice little nook to corner the power supply unit, and then I could glue brackets down from there to further secure the PSU in place. Back to the table saw, 
to rabbit out the corners for the uprights. I'm using painter's tape to help clamp the corner pieces together, a very useful trick I learned through places like YouTube and other social media platforms. For the top piece, I'm gluing brackets in place, spaced exactly the same as the rabbits on the bottom piece, so I would have something to attach the vertical supports to at the top of the case. Another 24 hours has passed and these corner pieces can now be untaped and any dry glue removed. Please do not chisel towards yourself like I'm doing here. I do not condone or encourage it. I currently don't have a vise hooked up to my bench due to those renovations I mentioned earlier. So that's why I'm chiseling like this. The brackets glued on the underside of the top are also done curing. And it's now time to clean up the rabbits on the bottom piece. I had to super glue some tabs to the corner pieces in order to give me a stable surface to rip grooves so that the tempered glass and panels could inlay and not protrude out any further than the current dimensions. Some quick test fits to ensure everything is fitting properly. And then I'll knock those super glue supports out and away we go. We are now ready to start gluing some of the structure together. Firstly, the bottom will be glued using only the top to hold it in place while the bottom dries. I will proceed to make some dowels with my trusty manual dowel maker. I'm a big fan of not using any metal fasteners and instead only using the wood itself to secure everything in place. So what I'm doing here is drilling holes for dowels to go into. My reasoning is that though the glue is super strong and will probably never let go, at least not for a very long time, I've seen it happen before and I've had to do repair jobs for people. And just as an added assurance that this joint will never come undone, I'm going to drive dowels perpendicular to each other so that the corner can never pull away even if the glue was to let go. Now it's time to glue laminate the backbone of this case together. I actually had one of those bigger pieces left at the end of this project, but I wasn't sure if I was going to have anything usable left. So just to be safe, I glue laminated the main support anyways. I guess it just goes to show you that you don't need the exact piece of what you think you do most of the time. You can actually make do with what you have. You just need to get creative. This is something I learned through Adam Savage's book, every tool's a hammer. Meaning, you don't need everything to be perfect having the exact right tool or materials for the job. You just need to get creative and resourceful to finish the job. So since this was glue laminated, I wanted to check for flatness before running it through machines. And sure enough, it wasn't perfectly flat. So this is where I'll grab the hand plane to take off necessary areas in order to give me a couple fairly true surfaces so that I can run it through the table saw and surface planer and know that I'm getting a square piece of wood. It's time to join the backbone to the uprights by first cutting dados in the uprights and then in the backbone itself. I just wanted to show you the precision of this rigid table saw with a straight edge. I used to wonder why I was always having to make adjustments and why everything I cut was close but never quite as perfect as I wanted it to be. Don't get me wrong, it's been a great table saw, but I'd say it's almost time for an upgrade. Now that we have everything fitting good, it's time to cross cut some tenons on the table saw. 
We'll clean up those tenons with a chisel and then we'll grab some mortise chisels to cut out some holes. These mortise and tenon joints aren't just any mortise and tenon joints. These are a special kind called tusked mortise and tenon, not requiring any glue. All you need to do is cut out a wedge, trace the angle, and carefully cut a second mortise through the existing tenon. The wedge then goes through the mortise locking everything together, kind of acting as a second free-floating tenon. It's really quite an amazing wood joint, and as stated before, Nicholas Kramer and his table were the main inspiration for this. I had never attempted this joint before, and it didn't come out perfect, but it worked quite well, and I looked forward to honing in on this joint for future projects. Right here, you'll see me cutting out the feet, and those will also be mortised, but this time, I'll use a different mortise and tenon called a drawboard mortise and tenon. Using dowels with slightly offset holes drilled in both members to draw them tightly together. And for this I will be using glue since this part will be supporting the weight of the entire PC, the case and all the not so cheap components. I will now take the motherboard tray and lock it in place with some clamps so I can mark the locations of where it will sit within the case and through extension where I'll need to glue in some guide rails and other tabs and brackets to hold the motherboard securely in place. I honestly don't know what to call all these glued in pieces of wood so I'll just be referring to them as brackets. If I'm wrong, please feel free to enlighten me down in the comments below. A quick test fit with the leg installed to see if the IO shield is fitting properly and we can proceed fitting the rest of the components. I placed the intake fans where I roughly wanted them to go, just so I knew where the main wire shroud would start, and then I proceeded to cut and glue thin lightweight pieces of wood to make the shroud, leaving lots of room for wires to feed through and reach the motherboard. Another test fit to see if wires would reach and exactly where the wires could go. Because after all, this is my very first PC build ever. And I'm building the case itself. So I'm far from a professional case builder at this point in time. I also installed the GPU so I could run some wires to that as well. This is probably my least favorite part of the whole build, mainly because of how I did it. You'll see me permanently gluing everything into place on this side of the case. The fans will be removable in case fans need to be replaced, but this whole panel, PC mesh included, will be permanently fixed in place. Now obviously, I could cut it out and make modifications to it if need be on the off chance that the mess ever got damaged, so I'm not worried. But if one was to build and sell cases to consumers, this would have to be altered to be easily removable and replaceable in case of damage. Next you'll see me glue more brackets in place to make up the framework that will hold the intake fans securely in place. And you'll see me do the same to the exhaust fan on the back. All the cover panels that you see me installing were made off camera. Again, I'm sorry but I'm really crunched for time with a million other things going on. But I will state that these panels were all made with very thin strips of wood ripped off those larger pieces of wood that I refined at the start of this video, with some light duty back bracing glued on to give it some structure. Nothing fancy, especially for the back. No one will ever see the back. It's just something to pressurize the container and contain all the wires and other components. So these little rubbery feet you see me taking off the tempered glass cutting board actually came in handy and were used on the feet of the case. Another piece I made off camera, and actually one spot that I cheated, I actually used a leftover piece of maple that I milled and refined from our own land to create this little air director slash wire management cover, basically another wire shroud that would also direct the airflow a little better. The piece that holds the glass in was also made from the bigger pieces of wood from the beginning of the video. 
and you'll see me putting in a few more dowels. I wasn't quite pleased with the sturdiness at this point, so this will provide much more structure to the whole case and hold everything in place securely. And it did work fantastically. I'll quickly point out that those dowels are only glued into the external components so everything can still be disassembled. And one last thing before major sanding and a full shop cleanup, I mitered some trim and glued it on to the top to clean up the edges. I think it turned out pretty good. Now it's time to give this thing a real good sanding and clean up all the mess I made to get the shop ready for finish work and PC assembly. You'll see me saying my goodbyes to the old rigid table saw. This is the last project I will ever do with it and I'm having myself a bit of a moment right now. After all, it has done so much for me and this shop. Couldn't have done it without you, buddy. Now that the shop is clean and dust free, it's time to finish all the wooden components with some mineral oil. Now, mineral oil is a bad choice for stuff like cutting boards and utensils. For the simple fact that it always remains in its oil state and never cures, but it's fine for an application such as this. There will be little to no wear on the surfaces, and after you wipe away the excess, it's dry to the touch. This is mainly to make the wood grain pop and give it a little added protection. Alright, it's time for the real exciting part. First, I'll install a little USB hub for some extra ports, because after all, you can never have enough. And then I'll proceed to assemble the motherboard. First, I'll slot the SSD, a 1TB M.2 from Crucial. Next up is the CPU, and for that we have an AMD Ryzen 5 5600. Don't forget to lift up the little lever and to match the little golden triangle on the underside of the CPU with the triangle on the socket of the motherboard and to lock the lever back down in place. Next I must take off the brackets since I'll be using the stock cooler and not an aftermarket cooler. After the brackets are removed it's time to screw the cooler down and plug it in where it says CPU fan. It's time to slot the RAM. And for that, we have two 8GB sticks of Delta R T-Force for a total of 16GB of RAM running at 3200MHz after DOCP is enabled. And don't forget to put your RAM in the correct slots. Usually, I believe it's number 2 and 4, which is what I'm using. Make sure to line your grooves up properly. It's now time for the assembled motherboard on the tray and the PSU to go into the case. CPU main power plugged in the exhaust fan with a little cage I made out of livestock wire to keep it contained from cats and vice versa, the two intake fans, and the motherboard's main power, front fans wired to the rear, GPU installed with temporary support, side panel and GPU mounted securely, GPU wires plugged in, and GPU bracket removed. Legs on. Tusks in. Tempered glass panel installed with anchoring faceplate. Power and restart installed on the tempered glass. A little more wire management back panels installed, and last, and maybe least, the CPU sticker, which I've always wanted to do by the way. And there she is folks. The time has finally come. Let's grab our peripherals and fire this baby up. Switch it on. We have light. We got light. All right. 
And as you can see, the first time definitely did not work. Luckily, I just had a couple of the front panel connectors mixed up and it was a quick, easy fix and she turned right on. And you can sure hear the excitement in my voice. <laughs> on to some BIOS settings and a fresh install of Windows 11 and that's pretty much a wrap. I want to thank you all for watching. It's been a huge pleasure learning and continuing to learn the ways of YouTube and creating content for all who watch. I told you guys I'd get better and hopefully this is a testament of that promise. I'm not going to be that guy who asked you to subscribe. Instead, I'll just leave it with you and you can decide what feels right. But by all means, drop a comment and let me know what you're thinking. I love and welcome the feedback.